Okay, says preparing to live stream the webinar. Okay, cool. So I'm going to turn my um, camera off. Um, the, did you want to show me what it looks like on your end really fast, or did you want to look at that later? Ah. Okay. So now I'm just seeing the California State Parks YouTube. So should I press stream to it? Oh. When you're ready to go live, that's what you're going to press, and you'll want to turn off the practice session first. Oh, looks like we're live on the custom streaming service right now. So it sounds like we are live on YouTube right now. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and broadcast us. Okay. Well, let's try and connect whenever you're free later. Thank, uh, but thanks so much for your time, Angie. Okay. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. What is it? Hello, everybody. Welcome to our home learning program for the day. I'm going to give folks a few moments to join us before we get started. We're just a couple minutes before one o'clock, so I'll give folks a moment to tune in. Hello, hello, hello. Just have a few more moments before one o'clock and then we'll go ahead and get started with our program today. Welcome to the first week of home learning programs after uh, an interesting summer break. We're welcome to be, we're happy to be back and welcoming all of you to join us virtually on these special virtual experiences from California State Parks. So thanks for tuning in. We're gonna have these programs every week, um, I believe over the fall semester. And it looks like we are here at one o'clock. So I'll go ahead and get started. Hi everybody, my name is Interpreter Angie, and I am excited to welcome you to our program today called Mysteries of the Deep. We're actually gonna be diving into the deep sea to discover what lives in darkness. So in this environment that you see behind me. And before we get started, I just wanted to give a little shout out to California State Parks. Of course, I work for California State Parks and we are bringing you these Ports Home Learning Programs for all of you that are maybe learning from home or learning online these days, this is a fun way to go on a virtual field trip to your parks and in this case to your marine protected areas. If you're on or your parents are on social media and you want to follow along with what we're doing every single day, we have programs at three on our North Coast Redwoods uh, Facebook page. And if you follow the Ports program, you can get lots of updates about the schedule for home, home learning programs and uh, lots of other good content as well. And I did want to go ahead and ask everybody who's out there today to maybe go grab a piece of paper or some type of art supplies that you like to use. I know for me, I like to learn what I'm also able to create at the same time. So if you like to draw or color or maybe build with Legos or do watercolor paints or finger paints, if you have those things at your disposal, I encourage you to grab them. Um, I'm going to be asking you, challenging you to create some artwork today. And if you feel like sharing it with me and some of the other people that are experiencing this program along with you, go ahead and tag hashtag ports fan art on any social media platform. And I will be able to see the artwork that you create. These are some of my students artwork from the past. And you can see we're using lots of different mediums 
and um, creating lots of interesting things. So we're, I'm going to tell you about what um, I'm going to ask you to create today in just a few moments. But let's go ahead and get ourselves kind of set up for our program. So go ahead and grab those art supplies if you haven't already. And uh, of course, most of you will probably recognize this map, this shape. It's a very unique shape. And it belongs, of course, to the state of California, our beloved um, state where all of our California state parks are. And I just want everybody to take a moment to maybe use your pointer finger and point out where on the map you are at this moment. Maybe um, you're pointing to your hometown or maybe somewhere, um, somewhere else where you are. I am up here where this red dot is in far Northern California in a city called Eureka. And of course we have our capital, Sacramento, San Francisco, Los Angeles and San Diego are big cities on the map. So go ahead and find roughly where you are and maybe compare to how far away I might be from you. I'm up here in Humboldt County in Eureka, California. And today we're actually gonna use the special green screen studio to travel down to where that red arrow is to the Lost Coast, which is a really special place up here um, that we are gonna be exploring the coast of today. Now up here where I live in far Northern California, we have a lot of these things. And I'm sure some of you out there might recognize what these special plants or these special trees are called. So if you do know it, maybe think it in your mind right now, maybe tell the person who's sitting next to you, watching with you, um, or maybe write it down on your paper, whatever you like. And of course, some of you might be thinking, those are redwood trees. And that is correct. We have lots and lots of redwoods up here. I live and work in the North Coast Redwoods District of California State Parks. And in most of our parks, we have these magnificent trees. Some of the tallest, they are the tallest trees in the world and they can be thousands of years old. So people come from all over to visit these amazing forests. And in a time when maybe we're able to travel a little bit more freely and there's not uh, kind of wildfires happening in the state, we welcome you up to our parks to come explore these amazing places. Now, these trees are really special and they're also very vulnerable for a few reasons. And that's mostly because there's only about 5% of these trees left at this moment, because a lot of them were cut down to build our cities that we know and love and that we live in. And um, now we, like I said, only about 5% left. And that's because there were some really smart people who said, hey, hold on, we need to leave some of these trees so people can learn about them and explore them um, for many generations to come. And so a lot of those, park, those trees, most of them actually are protected in California state parks. And of course you might not recognize this habitat because maybe you live in a different type of area. So I want you to think about maybe what the natural environment near you looks like. Um, I've showed you what mine looks like, the redwood forest, but maybe you live near some grasslands or prairies, or maybe even near the desert, or near some high elevation forests or, or valleys like Yosemite. Now, of course, in California, we have lots of different um, types of natural areas, many of which are protected and represented in California state parks. But a lot of people don't know that there is a lot of diversity or variety in habitats that exist off the coast of California, just a stone's throw from our coastlines. And those include estuaries and rocky reefs and deep sea canyons, uh, tide pools, maybe a, a good interface where people can explore the marine environment. We also have sandy bottom environments and my personal favorite, the kelp forest, which is sort of like the redwood forest, but underwater. And um, with all of this diversity of habitats, both on land and in the ocean, there's a whole lot to learn about and explore here in California. And I'm excited today to take you into one of these marine habitats that's gonna be the deep sea today. So of course, no matter what type of habitat you live in or that's your favorite, we all share this beautiful blue marble <laughs> that's floating in outer space, planet Earth, and I'm sure all of you have heard our planet be called the blue planet before. And I'm sure you can guess why. Just by looking at this photo, you can see that most of our planet is covered by the color blue. And of course that is our ocean on planet earth. 
And a lot of people maybe think that we have multiple oceans. Maybe you've, hear, you've heard people say, sailing the seven seas, as if we have seven different oceans. Um, but really, we have one ocean on planet Earth that we all share, and it's something that connects everybody in the world, no matter how far apart we live from each other. And this blue body of water actually takes up 71% of the planet. Um, of course, that's a majority of space on planet Earth is occupied by the ocean, by water, watery environments. And that leaves about 29% for uh, the land, which is where all of us live and all of our land animals that we know and love live. And of course, on land, that's where our redwood trees are and our other protected places in California state parks. And in California, we have something that's really similar to California state parks, but they exist underwater and they're called marine protected areas or MPAs. I wonder if any of you have heard of MPAs before. Hmm. And if you have, maybe think to yourself what you know about them. Maybe try to recall the things that you've learned about them before. And I want everybody now to go ahead and close your eyes and maybe transport yourself into um, your sort of imaginations, interpretation of the underwater world. Maybe an underwater scene that you've experienced or that you've seen on a movie or on TV, or maybe something that you're just dreaming up in your imagination. Maybe it includes animals or sort of underwater life forms. I want you to keep that in your mind while we look at this beautiful underwater video of California's ocean. Now, some of these animals might look similar or maybe different to things that you, you pictured or you have experience with before. Maybe if you know what some of these things are, you can um, maybe write them down or try to name as many as you can. But of course, when we look out at the ocean, we don't always see all of the life that lives beneath the surface. But today we're really gonna have a chance to dive into the ocean and look at one of the largest, the largest and the least explored habitat on planet Earth, which is, um, like I said, the largest habitat that we have on this planet. So I wonder if some of you maybe pictured kelp or pictured some fish. Oops, sorry, I'm a little blurry. Come back, there we go. And um, I'm curious now if some of you are familiar with maybe some of the things that our ocean is facing right now, maybe some negative impacts. One of my conservation heroes, her name is Sylvia Earle, and she has always reminded me that humans can impact the ocean, not just by what we put into it, but also what we take out of it. So that might give you some hints for some of the things that are impacting our oceans today. So go ahead and think of some uh, maybe negative impacts that humans might have, or maybe even positive impacts that humans can have on the ocean, um, and keep those in your mind. And I'm going to review two today really quickly, just to get us all in the mood of um, exploring the ocean and hoping that we can protect it. One thing that a lot of my students always say is pollution. And of course, we most of us know that there is pollution making its way into the ocean one way or the other, and there's a lot of plastic getting into the ocean. So I actually took this picture um, when I was in Hawaii last year, and I was just hanging out on the beach and I thought, wow, I'm gonna go just kind of check out, see if I can maybe find some shells or some, some cool stuff to see. And I ended up spending about 15 minutes collecting all of this plastic debris from the beach. So again, we put in things to the ocean that maybe um, have a negative impact, but we can also take things out of the ocean um, like plastic that maybe has a positive impact, but we can also take things out that might also have a negative impact as well. And one concept that I think is really important that we understand is something called overfishing. Now we're really lucky in California because we haven't had a huge problem with overfishing. Most of our um, ocean doesn't look like this, right? And we never want it to. And that's why we created these things called marine protected areas, which essentially tell humans, hey, let's slow down. Let's leave some of that life out in the sea so that we can continue to learn about it and enjoy it um, for many years to come, just like when we protected our redwood trees. Okay. So marine protected areas 
are a really, really special, special thing that we have in California. And they create um, something that might look like this. Okay, so on one side of this picture, we have an MPA, and the other side, we have an unprotected area. Now, I want everybody to go ahead and make some observations about this photo, both sides, and maybe notice the differences. This photo is really worth, or this illustration, is really worth a thousand words when it comes to telling us what marine protected areas do. So you might notice that over on our MPA side, we have lots of kind of greenery underwater. So that's our kelp or our algae. And then we also have some fish. We have a lot of fish. And not only do we have a high number of them, but we also have um, multiple different types of fish, different species. So biodiversity or the variety of life. We also have this cute cuddly predator called the California sea otter. And it's really good to have predators in the marine environment. Um, because they help to keep that, that seesaw in balance. And then we also have our seabirds up here, which are a good indicator of if the ocean is healthy because they like to hang out where they have lots of food available. And then over on the MPA side, without me even having to say anything, you can see the differences underwater. Maybe we don't have our predator. And we also have somebody up here um, called an angler or somebody who's fishing, right? Um, so maybe we have less fish in the MPA because we have more pressure from people removing animals from their home. And this person's actually really smart because they're hanging out near a place where there's lots of fish. And those fish swim in and out of the boundary occasionally. And uh, California's MPAs do a lot of really great things for the coast. And we're going to talk about um, some of those different places today. But today I want to take you down to this habitat. So in this photo, you can see those habitats we talked about before. We have rocky reefs, estuaries, tide pools, kelp forests, sandy bottom environments, and of course, this eerie looking part of the photo or the picture, uh, which is the deep sea. And today we're actually gonna dive into the deep sea together um, to explore some of the animals that live there and some of the challenges that they face. And I always say, that when we're preparing to go into the deep sea, this is sort of like your briefing to become a new deep sea explorer. Um, it's a lot like exploring outer space. So I want all of you to think, if your dream was to become an astronaut, what equipment might you need to help you explore outer space? You might be thinking, ooh, I need a spacesuit that looks like this. Yeah, you're right. Because our bodies, um, are really kind of adapted or made to live on Earth, not really survive in outer space so well. So we need some things to protect our body, to bring our air that we breathe with us, um, and so that we can see maybe. And we also have and maybe need a spaceship, right? We can't just drive our car into outer space if we want to go exploring there. So we need that special tool to help transport us. Now, when we're exploring the ocean, which I always say looks a lot like an alien world because there's lots of interesting looking animals that live in the ocean and especially in the deep sea, um, we need similar equipment. So I'm gonna go ahead and change my outfit really quick into our kind of underwater equivalent of a spacesuit. So here I go. Oh my gosh, so fast. Here I am in my wetsuit and my scuba diving gear. And I always say that this feels like, um, kind of like the astronaut outfit for an underwater explorer. And unfortunately, our, our scuba gear can't take us super duper deep in the ocean. So we're gonna need something else to help us that I like to say is sort of like a spaceship because we're gonna explore this dark, distant, mysterious habitat a lot like outer space today. And we're actually gonna use this tool right here which is called the Beagle. Everyone say, hi, Beagle. It is a remotely operated vehicle or an ROV. And this remotely operated vehicle is not a submarine. So nobody's sitting inside of this. It's sort of like an underwater drone, if you're familiar with drones at all. Um, so you basically control it using a remote control, tell it where to go, and it does some things to help us explore. So I think ROVs are super duper cool. And you saw some examples of some of my students who um, made some artwork inspired by ROVs. So if you feel like you wanna design your own ROV, I've 
uh, received submissions from students who made an ROV that's shaped like a fish, maybe even has scales or gills and has really fun and creative tools. So if you feel like creating your very own ROV and you wanna share it with me, I would love to see it. You could also just draw the beagle if you're feeling less creative today. So the beagle is gonna help us dive into the deep sea today because we're not gonna bring our scuba gear, gear down there right now. So to test your knowledge, I'm curious if anybody out there knows how deep the very deepest part of the ocean is. So maybe go ahead, pull back uh, maybe some, some previous experience or some previous knowledge you have about the deepest parts of the ocean. Um, and think about how deep the ocean is in feet. Hmm. Well, my friends, the ocean is actually 36,000 feet deep at its very deepest point, which is in the Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific Ocean. And to put that in perspective to you, that is equivalent to the distance of 100 football fields. So imagine running from one end zone to the next and then doing that 100 times. That's the distance you would have to travel to get from the surface of the ocean down to the very, very deepest part. And of course we have this area um, up above here. You might notice that this part of the, the photo is really dark, it's black, right? And then up here we have blue, right? So this is the blue water of the ocean. This is the place where the sun illuminates and um, kind of shows us the things that live there, like in the videos we saw before. And that portion of the ocean lasts for about 650 feet. And then after that point, which is about equivalent to two Statues of Liberty stacked on top of each other, it's always dark. It's like somebody turned off the lights and all of those animals and their habitats exist in darkness all the time. There's no way to turn those lights back on because basically the sun rays from up above the surface of the ocean, they aren't strong enough to reach past 650 feet um, through the water, okay? So now you know a little bit about how deep the ocean is, what a remotely operated vehicle is, what marine protected areas are, uh, and now let's introduce you to where we're gonna explore today. We are going to the lost coast of California, which is one of the last undeveloped stretches of coastline in California. You might notice there's no big cities or towns or roads that are running through this portion of the coastline. And we are going to a special marine protected area called Matole Canyon State Marine Reserve. Now this is called Matole Canyon because there's actually like an underwater canyon um, that's really deep here. It's about 2,000 feet deep. So we aren't going down to 36,000 feet today, but we are gonna go to about 2,000 feet. And remember that's past that 650 foot mark so it's gonna be dark down there. And of course, we're gonna use our trusty friend, the Beagle, our remotely operated vehicle to explore this protected area, which is shown on this map in this red color. And the red color basically means, hey humans, you're not gonna take anything out of this zone. I like to uh, refer to our red or state marine reserves as um, kind of like base in the game of tag. So our marine life, is constantly trying to escape predators and to survive. And in this zone, they don't have to worry about escaping from humans because we're not allowed to take them um, out with us. So if you like to fish, this is a place where you can't fish, but you can fish in this blue area, right? So that's our marine protected area that we're gonna explore today. Now, we are going to be on board a research vessel with my friends here who are putting the beagle into the water. Now, since you might be designing your own ROV today, I want you to make some observations about what this remotely operated vehicle has attached to it. What are the tools that it um, might need to help us explore? What things from the Beagle might you wanna include on your remotely operated vehicle that you're designing today? Now you can see the beagle being put into the water. The boat is rocking and rolling. And just over on the left side of the screen, I believe on your, on your screen, um, you'll be able to see my friend Andy, who is 
controlling the beagle using a remote control. So you can see right here, um, this might even look like maybe your Nintendo remote or your Xbox remote. It works a really similar way. So the remote basically tells the ROV where to go and when, what direction to turn, what speed to go. Um, so I want you to tell me or think in your mind, since you can't type in any comments, um, what tools did you notice that the ROV had attached to it? I'm sure some of you noticed these really big lights here, which are sort of like their flashlights or like headlamps that you might use if you're going on a night hike to see in the dark. Because remember, it's really dark where we're going. And you might have also noticed that there's lots of cameras on the ROV. Now the Beagle actually has seven different cameras that serve different purposes but mostly these cameras act like our eyes underwater because we don't have any humans sitting inside of this ROV. It's not a submarine. So we're gonna actually record photos and videos during our expedition into the deep sea. So now that we've gone over all of that, I think we're all ready to dive in. So let's go check out what this, the bottom of the ocean floor looks like in Matole Canyon State Marine Reserve. Wow, it's amazing to think we're 2,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. And you might be noticing that this isn't a flat environment. We have lots of rocks and kind of interesting structures, interesting organisms living in this environment. Of course, you'll also notice it's really dark. So all of the kind of blue and illuminated portions of this video are because those bright lights on the ROV are kind of leading the way. You also might notice that there's no kelp or plant-like algae that lives down here in the bottom of Matole Canyon. And I want you to think why that might be. Now our kelp and our algae, um, specifically giant kelp that we saw before, is sort of like the plants that we have on land that are green, that require sunlight to make their energy. Um, to photosynthesize. So there's actually no photosynthesis happening here because we don't have any sunlight, right? And uh, I want to introduce you to one of my very favorite animals, uh, which is the rockfish. And we have a lot of rockfish here coming into view of the beagle while we're exploring the deep sea. Now, our rockfish are sort of like homebodies. So maybe all of us are much more used to spending a lot of time at home right now. And these animals really like to stay close to their, their home area. Um, they like to eat things like crabs and fish and octopus and squid and shrimp and even worms. So I know all those first things that I listed are maybe things that you've eaten before. Maybe you haven't eaten worms before. <laughs> but we do have a similar diet to uh, these rockfish. They're called rockfish because they like to hang out near rocks, kind of underwater rocks and boulders that you might see in this video. Now I want to introduce you to a very special rockfish that I like to call the mascot of marine protected areas. Here we have a smaller rockfish and then, oh my gosh, comes into view this big old fertile female fish or a boff. So everyone go ahead and say boff. Now our fish in our marine protected areas are likely to get bigger and older because again, they have one less predator, us humans. Um, and so I wanna introduce you to two rockfish that I brought into the studio with me today. One of which is right here. You can see it's quite smaller than our boff on camera. And this fish right here is about seven years old. So I want everybody to go ahead and take a guess of how many babies um, this fish, this seven-year-old fish, can have in one year. Hmm. Maybe you're thinking of some other animals you know and how many babies they have. Usually I get guesses between the number one to the number 500 or even 1,000. And people are usually shocked to find out that this rockfish can have 150,000 babies in one year of life, which is pretty impressive. Of course, not all of them survive, uh, but every single year, 150,000 babies. 
But when we have a big old fertile female fish, like the one we just saw in the video, maybe closer to this size, I'll hold them up next to each other so you can see the difference. This bigger, older fish is 18 years old, so 11 years older. And it can have 1.7 million offspring. So 1,700,000 babies every single year when it gets to this age. And it's really good to have big old fertile female fish in our MPAs because they help to create more fish for our marine protected area and also for the surrounding areas as well. So remember that person who is fishing right next to the MPA might be a good spot to catch some of the offspring of that boff. All right, my friends. So now I want to introduce you to another very um, peculiar looking animal. And I'm curious if anybody out there knows the name of this animal here. Hmm. Maybe um, you're familiar with this animal or maybe it looks very strange and new. And I'll go ahead and let you know that this animal is called the giant California sea cucumber. And I know I have a cucumber at home in my refrigerator right now and it looks nothing like this other than maybe the shape. Um, but these animals live in Matole Canyon State Marine Reserve in quite an abundance. So they benefit from being protected because some people actually like to eat these animals. Um, but they do a really important job for this habitat. They are like the vacuum cleaners of the deep sea. You might notice that the floor of where they're hanging out is pretty dirty with lots of brown, sort of dirty, dusty looking stuff. And what they're doing right here is having a nice meal. All of this brown stuff here is called marine snow, and it basically rains down from the surface of the ocean. It's made up of dead animals, dead plants, sometimes even human, um, pollutants that make their way into the ocean, everything eventually falls down. You can imagine maybe a dead whale floating on the surface. Eventually, all of the parts of that whale will drift down to the bottom of the ocean and become food for these animals right here. They're truly um, sort of like scavengers. <laughs> they clean up the deep sea floor. So they're using their mouth right here to pick up lots of dirty sand that's covered in marine snow. And they basically clean off that sand and then out the other end comes clean sand. So like I said, they sort of like uh, are the vacuum cleaners of the deep sea, cleaning up the space for everybody else. Here's what they look like up close. You might notice they look really spiky, but actually um, they're really soft and squishy animals. So they're definitely soft bodied. Um, and they also have these legs right here, which are called tube feet, sort of like straws with a suction cup on the end that help them to move across the ocean floor and sometimes even up steep surfaces. Now when the sea cucumbers open their mouths, they look like this. Now these white um, kind of feathery tentacles are called oral tube feet and they function sort of similar, similarly to our tongues do. They help them eat. But instead, imagine if your tongue could reach out of your mouth, grab your cheeseburger or your veggie burger and bring it back in to eat. That's what these oral tube feet do. So I wanna show you what they look like in action. And of course they need to have these functioning oral tube feet to help them do their important job in the deep sea of um, being the vacuum cleaners, cleaning up that dirty sand. Now I think these animals are super duper fascinating and they do some very strange things. One thing that's called um, evisceration which means that when they get startled, actually it's not entirely clear why they do this, but I've always understood that when they get startled or maybe want to scare away a predator, they will eject their internal organs either out of their mouth or out of their butt sometimes, very strange and gross, um, to distract the predator. And they're able to regrow their internal organs after they do that. So I would say that's very alien-like, sounds like out of a creepy space sci-fi movie, but this is a real life animal, the giant California sea cucumber that lives in Matole Canyon State Marine Reserve. So now I have a fun challenge for all of you. We are going to practice being deep sea explorers ourselves. Um, since we're down here on the bottom of Matole Canyon, I want you to actually take on the job of some of our deep sea researchers 
And one of the things that they do is identify and count and sometimes even estimate the size of the animals that they see. So I want you to count how many giant California sea cucumbers you see in this about 30 second clip. And it's a really good challenge. So I'm curious um, what you all will come up with. Just to give you a hint, there's one right here and one right here. They look sort of like the shape of a, sea, of a cucumber, um, but they're brown, beige, orangish colored. All right, here we go. Keep your eyes peeled. All right, my friends, maybe you were able to count all the sea cucumbers in that video. There's one right here and there's one right there. If you counted 18, you counted them all. Nice job. Pat yourself on the back. Everyone else, if you didn't count 18, pat yourself on the back too. It's a good challenge. Um, and if you ever want to become a deep sea researcher, that's something that you might do is count and size and identify the animals that live here in the deep sea. All right, my friends, I wanna show you one last animal. This is actually truly my very favorite marine creature. And of course our marine researchers who are diving into Matul Canyon State Marine Reserve actually came across this animal using the beagle. So remember all this footage is from our remotely operated vehicle. And this of course is the giant Pacific octopus. Again, one of my very favorite animals. They are truly fascinating and pretty enchanting to watch. So I'll let you enjoy um, this video of this animal while I tell you a little bit about them. So of course our octopus has eight arms and on each arm there's two rows of suction cups that help them to hunt and move. Um, and they are called giant Pacific octopus for a reason. They can be up to 16 feet in size, which is about the size of two garage doors, and they can weigh between 110 to 600 pounds. So they can really be huge. Um, and these animals are really masters of camouflage. I just recently watched a documentary about um, the common octopus and has a lot of similar similar characteristics as the giant Pacific octopus. And these are incredibly intelligent, um, witty animals that have evolved for a million years, learning how to be um, impossible to find. So they are really good at camouflaging. They can actually change the color of their skin and the texture of their skin. And they can basically pour themselves into any small um, crevice or space. So they have a lot of really extraordinary um, capabilities. You might also notice some of our giant California sea cucumbers are here as well. Uh, one thing that I find super fascinating about our giant Pacific octopus um, and all octopus is that they have nine brains. One brain that sort of is their, their central brain or that controls their central nervous system. Um, and then we have smaller brains in each of their eight arms. So basically their entire being is like a feeling, sensing, knowing um, component, which is pretty amazing. And the, the thing that allows them to be such incredible um, at camouflaging is two types of cells in their skin called chromatophores and iridocytes. And if you ever wanna check out those two words or sound super smart and cool when you're talking about octopus, um, you can say that their skin is made of chromatophores and iridocytes that help them to change color and texture. Move out of the way so you can check them out. I know I could watch this animal probably for hours, because like I said, they're my favorite. And I think they're just so, so beautiful and uh, really enchanting to watch. So you can see their eye right here.
All right, my friends, I hope you enjoyed getting to meet that giant Pacific octopus. Um, I know that's one of my very favorite animals to see when I'm underwater. And um, sorry, let me get less blurry. There we go. Uh, and so this special lingcod is waving goodbye because we're all going to head back to the surface and wrap up our program for the day. Now, we started out here in outer space looking at planet Earth. And we talked about how most of our planet is covered by water and just 29% is covered by land where all of us live. And I wanted to just um, kind of bring it back to the idea of protected places in state parks and in marine protected areas and let you know that actually only 12% of land on earth is protected in some way, whether it's a state park or a national park or some type of ecological reserve. Um, and only about 4% of our oceans are protected. And that number is actually growing over time as people start to realize how um, beautiful, fragile, and valuable our, our healthy oceans are. And in California, we're really, really lucky because we actually have 16% of our waters protected just in California. Remember that 4% was for the whole planet. And they're protected in California's marine protected areas. So we have 124 of them that span from the shallow tide pools to the deep sea like Matul Canyon State Marine Reserve. And these are your places to explore and play and learn from. They're like living laboratories. So next time you're out on the coast, be sure to check out if there's any MPAs near you and um, what they're called and who might live there. So again, thanks everybody for joining me. I'm Angie, I'm an interpreter for California State Parks. If you wanna follow along, join us on social media. And of course, if you designed a really cool remotely operated vehicle that you want to share with me or with your fellow um, Ports fans, go ahead and share it under the hashtag Ports Fan Art. You can build it, you can draw it, you can paint it, whatever you can dream up, I would love to see it. So thanks everybody so much for tuning in. Don't forget there's home learning programs happening every single week, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we can't wait to connect with you. Bye.